Hi, in this lecture I'll be talking about one company, Bank of America, and how that company during the 50s and 60s used some of the first uses of information technology to transform not just how they did business, but eventually how to trans transform a whole industry and change the competitive landscape within consumer banking or retail banking um, with, with this new technology. The case is quite old and you may wonder why am I talking about this in a course about modern technology? Um, what is, what's the relevance here to mobile payment systems or internet or machine learning? Well, um, we see certain patterns happening when new technology comes in and changes industries and they are the same. Um, even today, we see these things repeating today. And by understanding history, to quote um, Fukuyama, we are not doomed to repeat it. So uh, let's get started. Let's understand something about Bank of America. Bank of America is today one of the biggest banks in the world, but it was originally started in 1904 by this guy. His name was A.P. Giannini, and uh, he was an Italian immigrant to um, the United States. And he started this bank in 1904 in San Francisco. Back then, it was very, very hard for people to get a bank account. You needed to have property, you needed to be quite rich, you needed to have a fairly long history in the community. And uh, what Giannini did with his bank, which was then called Bank of Italy, um, was that he was willing to take deposits and give credit to immigrants based not on how much money they had, but on how hardworking they were, on their character. And this was quite different. He specifically started the bank to be the bank for the little man. Uh, he started it in San Francisco um, and uh, the bank became quite popular. Um, eventually it had branches all over California and in the 1920s he bought another bank in uh, Los Angeles. That bank was called Bank of America Los Angeles and uh, the whole, um, whole bank changed its name to Bank of America. So when the Second World War came, Bank of America was the, the biggest bank in California um, in terms of the number of customers and the number of branches. Okay, then the Second World War happened. Well, the World War changed a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that changed was how people got paid. Before the Second World War in the United States, you largely got paid in cash. And it was a cash economy. People didn't have bank accounts and they certainly didn't have checking accounts. Um, well, in the Second World War, a lot of the men in America went into the armed forces. And uh, when you're in the armed forces, you're paid by the government. But for a large portion of the men, the pay was not for them. It was for their families. And the United States military um, services did not want to ship cash around the world. Plus, if you're a soldier, you don't need that much cash. Your family, however, needs cash. And in order for money to go to the family, it was necessary to have a bank account. So very, very quickly, a lot of people in the United States got themselves a bank account. And um, what also happened was that um, the wives and the families of the soldiers um, had to step into the jobs that the soldiers vacated. Um, and also, there was a tremendous buildup of industry in the United States, and uh, it had the effect of moving people from the central part of the United States out towards the coasts where war production was going on. So what happened was the population of California increased tremendously, but also the use of bank banks, uh, banking accounts, increased tremendously and Bank of America was the biggest bank in the biggest state, the most rapidly growing state, with the highest use of banking accounts or checking accounts. Okay, uh, now 
In order to understand how checking is different than cash, we need to understand how a check moves around. So if you have a bank like this, you have two people, person A and person B, and person A writes a check to person B. And we look at this check, we can see a bank account number, it has a standard format and so on. But back in those days, a check was just a piece of paper and you wrote on it that, you know, you signed that I, person A, is paying to person B a certain amount. And you give that piece of paper to person B. A person B can go to his or her local bank account because banking back then was local. Everything happened in the local branch. So you take the check there and the people in the bank branch, they take this check and they look at it and say, OK, you received a certain number of dollars, let's say $50. OK, that means that you can either get the money in cash or you can get uh, the money credited to your bank account. So they say, OK, this person B has received a check. We hold this person's bank account. OK, we credit $50. But the local branch need to get that money from somewhere. So they send it to branch A. That is the bank branch of person A. It could be the same, of course, but quite often it was different branches. So they send it to a different uh, branch, branch A, which receives the check and says, OK, um, person A has drawn $50 on his or her account. OK, so we need to get the book for person A. The accounting system was manual back in those days. And to deduct $50 from, um, from that bank account. And then we stamp the check, cancelled. And we send the check back to person A with a stamp saying that it has been cancelled. That means that the money has been drawn from that account. Well, this is a quite cumbersome system. Everything is manual, but there weren't that many people using um, checking accounts, and um, in the beginning at least. Um, and uh, people only used checks for quite important payments. So, you know, it, it became, it was, um, um, it was manageable to do this in each individual branch. Okay. Second World War ended, people came back. The economy was flourishing after the Second World War because America was rich and the world needed its goods. And California was the biggest state with the most people and with most of the checks or most of the checking accounts. And what happened was that more and more people started to use checks more and more. This created an operational problem. In the bank branches, they received more and more checks that needed to be cleared. And um, the way you did that was that you had people, you hired lots of people to sit and look at checks. Back then, there were no bank account numbers. You had to look at a check and you had to recognize the signature because the checks weren't pre printed, there were no names on them. Remember, this was before computers, okay? So, you know, you get a check, you have to recognize the signature, and you did that by either by just recognizing it or by looking it up in signature books. So you had every branch had all their customers' signatures, and you had to leaf through these books and look at the signatures. And this was a very cumbersome and tiring job. Another problem was that more and more checks meant that even if they hired more and more people, they just couldn't finish clearing the checks before they had to open the next day. So people were, they had to actually reduce the opening hours in the bank branches because everybody was sitting downstairs looking at these checks. And this was beginning to become a serious operational problem. It was eventually an operational crisis. Something had to be done. And the way they did it was basically by inventing the modern bank. And what the modern bank meant was that they started to use machines to read checks and they started to use computers to keep track of how much was in the banking account. And these were not small computers the way we see them. These were huge systems with very limited uh, capacities. And the first system that was built was built by Bank of America and it was called IRMA. And you see um, the, the IRMA system here. Um, and in order to make this work, 
the bank had to invent a lot of things. They did this in a project together with Stanford University. And uh, this happened in between 1956, 1954 to about 1960. And they invented a lot of things that later has become standard in, in banks all over the world. One of the things they invented was bank account numbers. So instead of having your name on a bank account, you had a number, which meant, of course, that you could have several bank accounts. And uh, they also, in, they also uh, came up with the concept of checks having a standardized size. In the United States, people still use checks, and the size of the check is the way it is. It's standardized because that's the size Bank of America chose in 1954 in order to feed the checks into their machines. They also invented a lot of algorithms. Here is one algorithm. If you look at um, a check like this, um, they invented, um, well, one technology they invented was something called MICR. Back then, computers couldn't look at a number and recognize it by sight. That's called optical character recognition, OCR. And that's what happens now when you look at your iPhone and it recognizes your face, facial recognition. That's because there's a powerful computer inside the iPhone. Well, back then, computers were not powerful enough to recognize things by sight. Instead, they used a technique called MICR, Magnetic Ink Character Recognition. And they had these special characters that you see here, the fat little one and so on and so forth. These, uh, this was printed with magnetized ink and the computer could read the magnetic signal and then automatically read the account number and the check number and what was called the routing number, which was a standardized way of identifying each bank branch. Okay, so now you see a standard check, a way of automatically reading checks. You still had to punch in the, the amount. Um, and now you could start to do this um, automatically. However, they had to invent a number of other things as well. Um, one thing they invented was something called modulus control. If you look at a bank number, this formula here, um, it basically said that an account number was a certain set of number plus an extra digit. And then they had this formula that said that you take uh, these numbers here um, and you put them into this formula and you divide it by 10 and you change the last digit, D9, in this formula so that the first, the modulus of dividing by 10 is zero. This is a complicated way of saying that the last number in the routing number and also in the account number was calculated. And the reason you do that is to reduce errors because you, if you, if you do this on this, this kind of control on every number that comes in, you can immediately identify if the routing number is wrong or the account number is wrong. And that reduces errors. So it's an example of what we call algorithms in computer science, methods you had to, in, in, to invent in order to reduce the number of errors in order to make industrial processing of checks reliable enough that you could use it instead of manual control. Okay. All this happened over a period, fairly short period, about four to five years, starting in 1954. It was done with Stanford University. It was eventually, uh, when it went into production, it was produced by, by IBM. And, um, and they created um, large industrial centers for processing all these checks that came in. There were two centers, one in uh, San Francisco, one in, uh, in Los Angeles, and uh, all the bank branches stopped processing checks. Everything was sent into these industrial centers. And you see the, the machines you see here, you fed the checks in, they could read them, they could um, present uh, the, the amount to uh, an operator who could punch in the amount by looking at the check, but everything else was read automatically. And, this, and then this went into a computer, which stored the information about how much each customer had in their bank account. Formally, that information was distributed out on each bank branch. So what you see happening here is a centralization of the operations and also a centralization of the information. 
This had huge consequences. Um, the Irma system and Bank of America was the first bank to do it. And the reason they were the first bank was because they got the problem first. They were the biggest bank in the biggest state with the most use of checking. They got swamped by all these checks and they just had to find a way of doing it. Once they invented all this technology, huge expense, huge risk, um, they derived a lot of the benefits. They centralized the operations in an industrial setting rather than people sitting in each bank looking at checks. That meant that eventually, as they got better at it, they got 40% lower cost than the competition. They did a study about five or six years after they had implemented this and, and got it going. And they concluded that their costs were 40% lower than their nearest competitor. So 40% lower operational cost than the competition. This is huge in the banking industry. And we'll get back to why it's so strategically important. Secondly, uh, it changed the role of the bank branch. Formerly, the bank branch was an operational bank in itself. It did everything, you know, keep the books, look at checks, operationally do this and that and so on and so forth. When operations were centralized and information was centralized, the bank branch could concentrate on service, relationship with the customers and marketing new services. The centralized information repository that everything was centralized meant that the bank could do a lot of controls automatically and make them available to the bank branch managers. So um, instead of um, before, um, each employee in the bank branch had to know, have a certain set of customers that they were responsible for. They had to manually check that the customers paid their loans on time. What happened now was that that control was centralized and done by computer and they mailed out printouts uh, on a regular basis and they could of course sort so that the customers that had not paid their bank uh, their, their loans would show up and on top of the list so the bank branch manager could look at it and take action uh, much earlier than the competition could and of course you know, the fact that loans that weren't paid were made visible meant that the bank got better liquidity management and uh, that meant that they got a lower cost of capital because they could, you know, they could identify who the bad customers were, either get rid of them or go after them and get their money in, hence lower their cost of capital. And the competition could not do that because they didn't have that information available. Then information technology became a foundation for better services. Um, you could eventually print statements about you know, what happened on your bank account to customers. So the customers themselves could get a better view of what was going on. But it also meant that you as a customer didn't need to go to the bank to understand how much was in your account. You could actually you know, um, take care of that yourself. And it also meant that you could start to look at um, the customer's pattern of interaction with the bank and start to extend credit based on that. You knew what the customer was doing. You knew more about your customers. You could be more precise when you extended credit. Eventually, this transformed into an innovation, a credit card that was linked to your bank account. Now, the banking industry was regulated. Bank of America was not allowed to go outside California. Um, and it was not allowed to go into other services, such as credit cards. So they started with a credit card linked to a bank account, but they were forced to sell off uh, that part of the business and establish it as an uh, independent business. And that eventually became Visa, uh, one of the two biggest credit card corporations in the world. So um, this was all this because of the use of computers to keep track of what was going on. Okay, um, there is a book written about this by Professor Jim McKenney of Harvard Business School. And in it, he talks of a cascading pattern when you get new technology coming into um, a, a, an industry. And it starts with a processing crisis. You need to have a crisis 
because otherwise you are not forced to look at new technology. And Bank of America was getting swamped in checks. Manual control clearly could no longer work. You had to do something. That forces the CEO, the top management of the bank, to look for a technical solution to the problem. Okay, you get an initial solution. You get automated banking, central processing. It takes care of the problem. It raises also the profile of technology. People say, okay, that this technology solved this problem for us. Maybe we could use it for other things. Maybe we can look to technology for solutions. Secondly, you align the structure with the system. This new way of doing things means that there's a whole lot of things you don't need to do the old way anymore. That means you need to change the organization. It changed the bank branches so they could do service rather than operations. And eventually, as the system becomes the new way of doing things, the whole organization changes. It becomes more centralized, but certain things like service and, and uh, customer relationship gets decentralized. Okay. Uh, then you get into a situation where information technology drives strategy. You get this information technology, you start thinking, can we design something new? Can we do new things um, in order to, to, um, to, to do this? And, and the Visa credit card system was, was one of the things that got created on the back of this processing capability. And um, what happens is you basically create a whole new way of running a bank. If you look at a bank today, centralized processing, centralized information repositories, distributed service, that is uh, a design, a way of running a bank, the modern bank, which basically became the foundation for every bank up until about 2010, when internet banking and online banking became the new standard. So basically from the 1960s up until at least the, uh, the 2000s, the dominant way of doing banking in the United States and most of the world is founded, was founded on Bank of America's model. And uh, we call uh, this way of doing things a dominant design. And when something becomes the standard way of doing things, then almost everybody does it the same way. And then, of course, all the other banks started to do the same thing. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the so-called dominant design becomes adopted by everybody else. And the competitive advantage that Bank of America had is gradually uh, reduced because everybody else is doing it the same way. They can learn how to do it from Bank of America. They can maybe do it with cheaper technology. They find new ways of doing things that are, that are perhaps better. And eventually it just becomes the standard way of doing things and Bank of America does no longer have a competitive advantage in being first. Or do they? Because um, one of the things you have to start thinking about is how can you take, what is a temporary competitive advantage? We have the cheapest processing and, and the best information, while others can copy what we do. How can we turn it into a long-term competitive advantage? Well, in order to understand that, you need to think a little bit about how banking, specifically retail banking, grows. Um, and retail banking grows when the population grows. But you need to think about how, do, how does the population grow? What happens when a lot of people move into a, a state like California? Well, everything was very local. Banking was a local thing with branches. So um, growing was a question of finding places to establish new branches. And um, well, how does that happen? Well, it has to do with population centers growing. So you can think maybe we have a population center, we have two roads that meet, and somebody decides to start a gas station there because there's traffic going by and people need gas, and the gas station owner needs a house. Um, eventually there's enough people stopping there that you can maybe start a grocery store and uh, the grocery store owner needs a house. Now we have a, the beginning of a very small town so the local farmer decides to sell some land and people build some houses there and then people build some more houses. Now you can have a bakery then you know perhaps a church 
the school, more houses, eventually the town is big enough that you can have a bank. Now, which bank is going to come first? Well, it is going to be the bank that has the lowest cost. And Bank of America had 40% lower cost than any of the competition. As a consequence, they tended to be the first bank going in when a town or a population center eventually got big enough that you could have a bank branch there. 40% lower cost, first in. Now think about that. Who do you get as a customer when you're the first bank in? Well, you get everybody. Okay, and then, you know, more people move there because now you have a church and a school and a bank and everything. So you get some more houses and you get some more houses. Eventually you get um, even more houses, bigger houses and so on and so forth. Now the town is quite big. It can support another bank, bank number two coming in. But which customers is that bank going to get? Well, um, they are going to get either the customers who don't want the first bank or the customers that the first bank don't want themselves. And it's going to have to buy those customers by offering lower interest rates or uh, on loans or higher interest rates on, 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 on bank accounts or perhaps lower transaction fees. And uh, of course, uh, the, the bank that's first has a tremendous competitive advantage not in terms of its cost of operation, that's sort of the initial thing, but in that it get the best customers and it, uh, it can relatively easy, easily maintain its big market share. And so you see that what we call externalities is, is tremendous in a growing market if you have the lowest operational cost because it means you're the first in. And that is how you transform something that people can copy in, in from you know, a temporary competitive advantage to a sustained competitive advantage. And normally when we look at something uh, from a competitive advantage viewpoint, we use this framework uh, by, by Barney, it's called a, the value-based uh, framework. You look at something, um, and you know, sorry, it's called the resource-based framework. You look at a resource like your operations capacity and you say, is it valuable? Well, if it isn't, um, it is a competitive advantage. And if you don't have it, um, then you have a very expensive operations, very expensive operations. And uh, um, I like the other banks had. Okay, secondly, you have to ask yourself, is it unique? And uh, if it's not unique, it's competitive parity. Well, in the beginning, it was unique, uh, but eventually more and more banks got it. They also get economics of scale and they could uh, catch up with the Bank of America. And uh, then you're looking at it, is it hard to copy? Well, in the beginning it was very hard to copy because Bank of America had unique knowledge about it. But what happened was that the people that built the computers for Bank of America turned around and sold the technology to the competition. That's always what happens. People learn from each other and eventually um, you 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 have what is called a temporary competitive advantage. And what you need to do is to manage that temporary competitive advantage so that you get a sustained competitive advantage out of it. And that's what Bank of America managed to do by using their lower cost to get the best customers and get the biggest market share by being first into a lot of places in California. So there you see um, the use of information technology by fixing an operational crisis gets you better information, which gets you lower cost, which enables you to expand and grow your market share. And that's what we tend to see happening when somebody gets a new technology. It's very rare that a technology sort of comes in and completely sweeps something out. What you tend to see in competition between companies is that somebody adopts a new technology, grow their market share. They don't dominate totally, but they can become pretty big by being fast in using the technology and most importantly, be fast in transforming their organization in order to take advantage of the new technology. And um, well, we will see more examples of this as we progress through this course.